Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this episode of State of the World. We have um, an exciting one today on Chinese on China's digital currency and its global implications. And we are so honored to have Yaya Fanusi with us here today. Welcome, Yaya. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. So this is going to be great for everybody. Yaya is adjunct senior fellow at the Center for New American Security. He is a former CIA analyst and the founder of cryptocurrency AML Strategies. His re research focuses on the national security implications of cryptocurrencies and blockchain technologies. And we have such an exciting event today. We have our moderator, Amanda Jolly, the VP here at the World Affairs Council of Connecticut. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Amanda. Thank you so much, Megan. And thank you most of all to Yaya for joining us today. Um, thank you. I, before we get into the moderated conversation portion of today's discussion, I know that this is a topic that is new to some. Um, so if there are any definitions that are needed, clarifications, anything you want to dive into further, um, please feel free to add that to the chat and then we'll make sure we get you some resources. So with that, thank you again for joining us and um, let's get started. Yeah, yeah, I know we have a lot to get into in terms of some of the big global implications of China's new digital currency. Um, and before we do, can you just lay the groundwork for us and define what is a central bank digital currency? What makes it different than other digital transactions we mm. might already be familiar with, you know, from mobile banking, PayPal, Venmo? What is this and how is it different? So just think about it. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, I guess I'd start off by saying, you know, think about a central bank digital currency as as digitizing the cash that you that you hold, a digital banknote. So basically you're talking about a nation taking its currency and creating a digital form, which has never happened before. And so this is where most people would say, well, wait a second, I do have digital currency because like I, I use Venmo and when I go online, I'm doing digital transactions, right? So, so this would be something different. And how, how would this be different than, let's say, Venmo or even PayPal? So here's the, here's the scene setter. The way digital transactions work now, it's really more about what's happening between banks, right? These intermediaries that you go to. Now you have an account. So Amanda, you have an account at, let's say, let's say Bank of America, not to just name anything specific. I don't know if that's true. But Bank of America, <laughs> but bank, at Bank of America, your account the way the bank sees that, they see that as a liability to you. It's like they owe you money, right? You have a deposit. So when you go to your account, it says that you have $100. Of course, you probably have more, but let's just say you have $100. And that is a liability to Bank of America. So when you send your money to Megan and she's at Wells Fargo, Bank of America is sending its liability to you to Wells Fargo. Now, guess what? What does Wells Fargo have? Wells Fargo now has a liability with Megan. And on the back end, Bank of America and Wells Fargo, now that they've done that sort of digital instruction to, to, to send those liabilities, on the back end, they have to work within themselves to settle the difference. Like they have to transfer not just the liability, but they have to trans transfer an asset that go with that. So it gets real complicated. I won't go sort of deeper than that. But this whole process, it's dealing with money, but really the root of it is these banks working with each other and settling the transactions based on what's happening between you and Megan. So, you know, how is that different, right? That's how Venmo works. That's how Bank of America works. A central bank digital currency, and especially, you know, I'm going to focus on how China is framing it. A central bank digital currency would be where the central bank that controls the money supplies, it puts out digital currency to these banks and payment providers, and then they hold it. And now what you have, Amanda, is now you have a liability, not with Bank of America, you have a liability with the central bank. This digital account that you have, or digital wallet, is now your really a direct relationship with the central bank digitally. So now when you do that transaction, the digital money, the digital central bank money is going from directly from your bank to Megan's bank. And so what does this do? Like, what's the bottom line of this? The bottom line is now the process of digital transactions is really about the central bank money directly. And the other thing is now that central bank money, that digital money, now the central bank has knowledge 
about the transaction because it's not something that just is going on between the Bank of America and Wells Fargo. Now what's transacting is the actual digital dollar or digital yuan or digital, you know, renminbi. It, the central bank is inserted into the process. Now it can look at that data. It can understand how money is moving. But in the current system, when Venmo transacts with Bank of America, the central bank does not know exactly what's happening with those transactions. So that's a little, you know, this is a big overview, but that's how it's different from how digital transactions happen currently today. That is so clear. Thank you so much for outlining it that way. And um, with that systemic structure in place, can I throw one more definitional uh, ask of you out there, yeah. which would be, what are some of the differences we should use? What's the definitions uh, between cryptocurrency, digital uh, currency, and where does blockchain come into to both of these? Good question. Um, sometimes they're used interchangeably, right? So a cryptocurrency may be a type of digital currency. But let's let's talk about the words that you're hearing probably most of the time. So a cryptocurrency, the most common one is Bitcoin. And the key thing to know is that Bitcoin and most cryptocurrencies are not owned by some government or some entity usually. It's sort of open source software that anyone can acquire, can access, can, can get involved in the printing or the minting or the mate processing of. Um, and in those transactions, that's how we you know, how we see cryptocurrency. So Bitcoin is this, you know, not, you know, uh, not constrained by national borders. And it's a digital currency. Now, what countries are doing with central bank digital currencies is something different. Most governments are thinking about, huh, wow, we see how Bitcoin allowed you to kind of transact digitally without an intermediary. We don't want a centralized, a decentralized system, but we want to figure out maybe how we can take some of the benefits, but we're going to have a more controlled system. We're not necessarily going to have the same blockchain technology necessarily where anyone can participate and anyone can be involved, but maybe we'll have a closed system that'll still be digital and we'll figure out a way to have a digital token, but it will be based on a different technology. So I'm talking a lot about China. And so China, so what is blockchain, right? So blockchain is basically just a system of decentralized ledgers where you sort of keep track of the ownership of of the asset on this uh, of this system, right? So Bitcoin has a blockchain ledger where you can see when one transaction goes to another address, right? It's this record. And it's, it's uh, built, it's authenticated over like different nodes and computer systems. Um, so that's a very interesting technological advance, advancement, innovation. But what China figured out was that they were looking at using that type of system, like a, a distributed ledger system. But here's the, here's the wall they ran into. They realized that if they want this to be a retail digital currency that like everyone would use when they go to the store, et cetera, that that architecture, that distributed ledger or blockchain architecture, which is useful for, for Bitcoin and for Ethereum, it doesn't allow you to trans uh, to transact in quickly enough or to, to, to support enough transactions that a whole economy would use. So they decided that they're not using blockchain for their digital currency. Mm -hmm. um, they are using blockchain for other aspects of their economy, and we'll get to that later. Mm -hmm. But it's not the China's digital currency is not going to be a blockchain. We just know a few details about it, but it it is going to be a digital currency where the central bank sort of gives it to the regular banks and the payment platforms. And then those payment platforms then um, facilitate transactions. They'll create the wallets. They'll create sort of like the interfaces. And then people will be in the retail world actually spending the central bank digital money every day, possibly. Excellent. Okay. Thank you so much, Yaya. And now that we have these terms defined and understood in that really, really excellent overview, let's get into what China's doing with the launch of their new uh, national digital currency. Uh -huh. So today, uh, China is one of the first major economies to launch a national digital currency. Uh, mm -hmm. So why now? What are the motivations behind China's uh, launch? And I think some acronyms you might hear today are CBDC, uh, which would yeah. be Central Bank Digital Currency for anyone listening. Um, or we might hear uh, C D C E P, which is the acronym for uh, China's D China's digital currency, in uh, specifically, uh, in case those come up. So yeah, yeah. Why now? What what motivated yeah. China to launch this? Well, it goes back to the scene setter, and let's let's dig a little bit deeper in terms of what's happening in China. You alluded to how mobile payments are pretty pretty prominent now, right? Pretty prevalent, and in China, that's definitely the case. 
So Chinese central bankers several years ago looked at a di dilemma or a conundrum. Many Chinese citizens are spending with mobile payments. There are companies like Alipay and, and uh, WeChat or uh, platforms. These are mobile payment platforms. And you know, 90 some percent of mobile payments and digital payments are going through these platforms. These platforms are, they're not the Chinese government. They are private Chinese company. Of course, the Chinese government has influence, but they're private Chinese uh, um, companies. And they, they are supporting so much of the retail transactions going on. The conundrum there is that this is a great technological advancement. Like, you know, people aren't using cash. They're using mobile payments so much and it's, it helps them with efficiency. They don't, you know, carry their debit card. They just have their phone, right? It's like, it's, it's a great advancement. But China was concerned, the central bankers were concerned that this was pretty risky. And I said, what if something happens to one of these companies and they go out of service? That would bring down like half of our commerce or most of our commerce. So they started to think about, hmm, how can we kind of rein this in a little bit? How can we develop a system where we're not so dependent, where commerce and our economy is not so dependent on these mobile payment platforms and their infrastructure? And there's also something else to it. China was also looking at data. And when China and any government, when they want to understand what's happening in the bank in the in their monetary system, they have to actually go to the banks and say, let's look at the data. Can you show us, you know, or let's say it's law enforcement. When they want when they're when they have an issue, they have to go to these companies and say, hey, show us the, the record of transactions. Because there's no system today, even though everyone thinks like Big Brother and everyone thinks like the government is watching them all the time. But but there's no like one system technologically where a government can look and see all all the digital transactions in real time. That just doesn't exist because of how the banking system is set up. And so one of the motivations is, you know, one, get a wrestle back control of the sort of payment system from these private companies and insert the government into it. And second, secondarily, um, leverage big data, leverage data, create a system where, where the government can actually look at and analyze transactions, even to the point of understanding like what users are doing. That's really how this system is, is going to be set up. At least that, that's what I assess based on what we know. So the motivation is mostly domestic, how to run the, 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 the economy. And I'll say two quick things before, I'll, uh, before your next question. One is this fits into China's broader financial technology strategy, or what I call fintech. And uh, the government came out a couple years ago with a three-year fintech plan. And that's, this is basically what it says. It says create a more dynamic financial technology infrastructure so that the government, the national government, can leverage data, use data. They're even talking about creating like a national data warehouse, right? This all fits into the idea that fintech is going to help them economically. So that's the domestic motivation. There is a geopolitical and there is an international motivation as well, which I'm sure you all are very much interested in. And part of that is uh, it's offensive and defensive. I mean, there's the sense that China wants to also make its currency more attractive internationally, and it wants it to be used for international trade. That's an interest. And also China is concerned about US influence in the global economy and the power of the US to impose sanctions. And the reason the US has so much power with, with sanctions is because of the US influence in the global banking system. So part of this is that China has a mindset or a view of trying to develop alternative systems that can uh, maybe buffer it against some of the U.S. financial power. Thank you so much, Yaya. And um, to follow up on one of the points that you really clearly outlined in the motivations um, is that you have stressed that this issue, the U.S. looking at China's digital currency, uh, it's an issue more of data than, um, than money, data over anything else. So can yeah. you explain why, can you dive deeper into that? Why are concerns around China's national digital currency uh, first and foremost around data and privacy? Yeah, I would, you know, I would often, I would say that it's, 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 it's more about data than it is about money. And, and even in China's fintech development plan, this is this 2019 plan that came out um, and looking at the translation, I don't speak it, but you know, we, at, at CNAS, we have a, um, a research assistant who, who, who does and who reads fluently. And we looked at this fintech plan and it's interesting that the fintech plan doesn't mention money at all. It mentions currency twice. 
and it mentions data 60 times throughout the document. Wow. Right. So this is the this is like this development plan about financial technology and how to like improve the finance of the country. And it's all about data. And so I think what this is, is because this is a natural phenomenon that I think we all understand, right? Any institution that's trying to sort of advance, you, you come to this position where you realize, given technology, that making your, your enterprise more efficient is all about what you can do with data, big data, aggregating data, leveraging data, understanding your users or your constituents. And, they, you know, I mean, like, we're all like, we all know this, right? When we when we deal with social media, like we know we're all in the data algorithm, right, of, of these companies. So this is a reality. So the, the, the Chinese government and the sort of the state economic planners have been, it's like they, they're pretty f um, firm with the idea that we have to base our economy on data. And the central bank for monetary policy, right? Like you can do more as a monetary um, uh, as a monetary policymaker if you understand how your money is circulating, and you can only do that right with with data. And so th they're thinking of advancements that would allow them to collect more data. Now the flip side of that, as you refer to, is well then well what does this mean about privacy, right? Are we going to this situation where the government has access and, and can see all of our private transactional data? So this, this is where the privacy concern is, um, is being dealt with differently in China than it would be dealt with here in the United States. I've looked a lot at the statements that the central bank has been making and privacy, what, what China describes as protecting privacy is this concept called controllable anonymity. Um, and it's a bit of an oxymoron when you think about it, because the, the, the central bank has been saying that there will be an anonymity in transactions, meaning that if I'm using the digital currency and you're using it, we may not know each other's information. Like if I go to, you know, if you own the store, like you're not going to know my name and my address, et cetera, et cetera, right? That, so that's the privacy. So that horizontally, there's privacy between users of the digital currency. But vertically, the privacy is controlled, meaning the central bank in the designs that we've seen and the sort of the sketches and the discussion, the central bank will have um, knowledge of the users, of who those individual wallet holders are, um, information about them and the tra transactions because sort of that's the point. <laughs> the, the point. The point of the central bank creating this is not to create a data set and, and all this activity that it, it then is locked out of. The, the intention is to be able to look at that data and to be able to drill down and have a little bit more economic influence economic control, economic insight. So the privacy issue is going to be the one. And I'll, I'll maybe just, um, I'll flag something that maybe we will we'll get to and maybe we'll, we'll want to end on. Because the question, Amanda, that's going to come up is, okay, so this is how this works in China. What if I'm an American? What if I'm a foreign firm? What if I'm an American firm that wants to do business in China? If I use um, the digital currency uh, electronic payment system or DCEP as it's called, if I use the digital currency, will China know about me and my spending habits, my transactional behavior, my counterparties, who I'm paying? Because the Chinese government wouldn't like know in real time, those details in our current system, that system where, you know, I described at the beginning how there's, you know, it's really between the banks and the central bank doesn't like know all the details. So if, if it's expanded to the rest of the world, what does that mean for China's collection of data outside of China? That's a big question that I think policymakers and business folks are going to have to grapple with. Those are some big questions. Um, and yes, we will try to get uh, mm -hmm. to them. Um, and before we get to those questions about what that might mean for larger, uh, for international privacy, for what this looks like when it's uh, potentially uh, integrated or exported to around the world, um, yeah. in China itself, we have an audience question that ties really well into this concept of um, okay. what can the, uh, the Chinese government do when they have this data uh, they they have access to these records uh, for mm. presumably every transaction of its citizens and businesses. What power mm. does that give the government? Uh, and one specific, two specific questions: Is, is this a tool for so, uh, China's social credit index? Mm. And um, another question from the audience is: Is this digital currency connected with cameras, facial recognition technology, and other ways of uh, of public surveillance? Very good question. So what can it do? So this is, um, you know, we have to get to a bit of, some of this is informed speculation, right? Because when you ask what can it do, 
the blueprint of exactly how it will work and even how the, the government is going to manage it, you know, you know, is not clear or, or hasn't been released, right? So I'm going off of, you know, what we've heard, what we've, you know, what, we, what has been revealed, and I'm sort of making inferences. I'll give you a real, like, like a pulled from the head, headlines example of what, what I think could happen. So many of you China watchers may have heard that over the weekend, there was this really big news. So I don't know if any of you shop at H&M uh, for clothing. It's a, a clothing manufacturer. Okay, you, you guys know H&M. So <laughs> H&M. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I thought you were gonna say, oh yeah, this is from H&M. No. Um, <laughs> that would have been so, that would have been so perfect. A little bit more planning on my part. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, H&M is a Swedish firm. And sometime last year, they published a statement. They basically said that they were no longer going to source their clothing from um, from the uh, the autonomous region, the uh, Xinjiang province, where the, the Uyghur province is, because they couldn't have insight in, ter in terms of whether or not cotton maybe was coming from forced labor. So they put out this, you know, it was not a big surprising thing, right? A lot of corporate corporations have been have been raising this issue. And so H&M said, you know, we're, you know, we're gonna, you know, stay away from that region just for now, because we have that concern. That was months ago. So a few weeks ago, a group connected to the Chinese Communist Party basically said, hey, look at what H&M has did. And what happened? The, over Last week, um, H and M was dropped from China from the leading Chinese e-commerce sites. This basically was retaliation. So basically, in China, if you had gone to your app and, to, and even tried to like go to like their version of Uber, if you tried to go to an H and H and M store in Beijing, H and M would not show up. So this is a long-winded way to say like what would be possible. So here's a scenario: if, for example, um, H and if the digital currency was sort of universal, then China could actually just, I would say, sort of almost flip a switch and make payments to certain recipients prohibited, right? Because it would have, you know, it would be a, a, a system that it really has control of. So in terms of dissidents, in terms of political, you know, polit political dissidents, um, it really gives the Chinese government power to censor transactions, to cut people off, actually to do more monitoring. Um, so, so those are some of the things that gives China more control of how money is spent uh, and how recipient and how, um, how users are transacting. So that's one thing. There was a question about cameras, which is a good question, and the social credit. I'll try to hit those super quick. So again, um, no, we don't know specifically about the social credit system, but I would infer that the social credit system would feed into it. Why? Because China already has its list of untrustworthy persons. And, you know, officials have already said that the fintech systems that they are developing will be aligned with that system. And, you know, and that relates to the social credit system, right? Because if people or community or, you know, certain, you know, certain people are put on this list, then it would be, yeah, very easy. Like the H&M example, it would be very easy for the government to, in a centralized way, say, uh, okay, boop, those group, those folks or those people, those, those users cannot transact. You can't transact with them. Now, whether it would also incorporate other data, facial recognition, I mean, this is where we get, um, there's no clear answer. I mean, I don't know specifically, but what I do know, this is what I'll I'll say is that the fintech plan that I've looked at, remember, it's all about integrating the data that the government is collecting. You don't have a system. I have maybe some of the, someone else knows, but I have not seen cries. I have not seen words of caution from the Chinese Communist Party saying, hey, we need to make sure we don't integrate facial recognition data with this as a government. I'm not hearing any anyone cautioning against that. So I think we can assume that data that is collected maybe through other spheres is probably going to be commingled. That's my guess. Mm, great point. Um, thank you, Yaya. And um, I know we're running up into our time limit. So two questions I think we can hit before, uh, before we reach that point. Uh, yeah. And it also incorporates some audience questions. The first one is um, that it's been said that this digital currency um, adoption and, uh, and um, issuing uh, could be the new uh, battlefield of competition. Um, so you've said that the biggest implications for the U.S. in terms of this digital currency uh, is going to be about long-term economic competitiveness, uh, which will happen mm. over decades, rather than some of the shorter-term concerns. And I know you mentioned them uh, in, in the intro about China's digital currency potentially displacing the dollar yeah. or undermining uh, U.S. sanctions. So can you tell us what is the long-term threat here for the U.S.? Mm. 
Ooh, that's quite the question, right? That is the that is the question of the day. So the long term threat here for the U.S. is the potential for the U.S. to sort of sit by while China, thinking decades ahead, is building infrastructure that will make it more competitive in the future compared to now. The strategy for China does not seem to be. Let's create something that's going to displace the dollar in the next couple of years, or even like the banking system. Let's replace the U.S. in the banking system today, and or the U.S. dollar. Like those might be things that you know maybe people are thinking about, but that doesn't seem to be the practical strategy. And the reason why is because I think it would take more than technology to do that, to displace the dollar, to you know sort of upend global trade and the, the dollar as a reserve currency. There would be much greater. Macroeconomic and political shifts that would enable that. So, to them, just creating a digital currency is not going to do those things. So, I, I, in the short term, I, I'm not concerned about that so much. But what can China do? And I think I honestly think this is how they've been thinking about it. What can China do? China can think about okay, all right, the U.S. is sort of the king in this in the global banking system as we know it. Well, China can think about well, hmm. What are what is the economy of the future? What is the infrastructure that's needed to use computer science to、um, drive finance? And you know what? Why don't we take the next ten years and build that infrastructure? So this gets into some of the other things that are happening, like blockchain technology.、Um, it relates to the digital currency somewhat tangentially because what China is doing with blockchain is China has now an effort called the Blockchain Based Service Network or BSN. And this effort is to build almost like a second internet. It's an internet. It's not separate, but it's sort of like cloud computing on top of our internet, where China is developing data centers and sharing storage and cloud space and developing an internet or a layer of the internet that it feels will be easier and better to use and will be driven by more data applications. That's what they're doing. So the danger there is, the danger is that. That China is actually going to be in a better position to do more types of stuff, and to and to facilitate new types of commerce, and to benefit from this internet in the same way that the United States developed the infrastructure of the internet, and then of course, quite naturally, capitalized off of that because hey, we had this, we kind of had the system, we developed the websites, we developed Web 2.0, right? It was our, it was kind of our infrastructure, and we built on it. China is trying to do the same thing with technology, and the digital currency. My thought is that the digital currency is going to be what's going to power these types of new digital applications. So I don't want to nerd out and get kind of you know into the weeds, but generally speaking, that's the approach. And as I've heard the architects of this new, like the blockchain-based service network and the folks, the folks that are building this, they have said quite frankly in open seminars that this is a, like a ten year, ten year plus. This is decades that they're. Talking about, so they're just focusing now on building the infrastructure, and then they want infrastructure that China will basically own, and so anyone that builds on it、um, around the world, it's not just for Chinese developers. Anyone that builds on these app on this network, they'll be on China's property. Excellent. I know we are slightly out of time. If we could steal a few more minutes to、uh, have our final question here, which is also incorporating a、uh, question from Beverly to close us out here. Uh, the U.S.、Uh, Treasury Secretary Janet, Janet Yellen mentioned、uh, that a U.S. digital currency、uh, was quote absolutely worth looking into.、Um, so, what is the U.S.'s move here? Do we?、Uh, do you think it's likely that the U.S. will launch its own national digital currency?、Um, if so, or if not, if you were the designer of this、uh, U.S. national digital currency,、uh, what is its defining characteristic, or a few defining characteristics? Uh, that makes it different from the Chinese、uh, national digital currency approach.、Um, what's the best case scenario here for what a national digital currency in the U.S. could do? Well, let me first say that for me, it's not a given that the U.S. should create a national digital currency. I mean, I think there are lots of other risks. I think there are lots of other considerations, even the cybersecurity implications. So I don't think it should be a given. I think the U.S. model should be different. What what do we sort of benefit from? We benefit from sort of open market innovation, free, you know, free market innovation, and we actually have been benefited from the fact that it hasn't been government infrastructure that that has、um, that our economy has、uh, has always emphasized. I mean, some of it has been, but but Really, it's been what the private sector has been able to do. So, I actually would point to 
trying to leverage some of these private sector efforts at digital currency, and maybe using things like stable coins to kind of help um, to build off of the dollar, to not replace the dollar, but to make the dollar um, able to transact more digitally, right? You could use private sector technology to get some of the benefits, the functionality, but you don't have to make it a centralized thing. So I'm not sure that we need to do that. And I, my, the, for me, the jury is out. But if we did, the one thing I would say, the one feature is that we should look for uh, keeping in place those things that actually restrict the data from being seen in real time by the government. If a digital currency is created, the US version should be one where the government should not have real time access to every user and what they're doing. It should be a system similar to what we have now where the government has to go through with a subpoena to get that information from the financial institutions. Thank you so much, Yaya. I know this went so lightning fast and we have a thousand other questions. So I hope you please consider joining us uh, in the future once again to get to um, the dozens of audience questions and know, uh, the questions so that we have ourselves too. <laughs> I know. I'm so sorry. I didn't, I, I didn't leave time for that many questions. Not, it's just oh, a reflection boy. of how much interest there is, how excellent you are at making this uh, so compelling and under and uh, understandable. And uh, we so appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Absolutely. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for State of the World. Uh, this was a fantastic conversation. Yaya, yeah, yeah, thank you. Amanda, um, fantastic questions. Great insight into what's going on with China's digital currency. I want to encourage everyone to um, tune in to State of the World. We uh, tape every Wednesday, and you can find, uh, find us on uh, wherever you find your podcast, State of the World, and subscribe uh, to our YouTube channel. Uh, at World Affairs Council of Connecticut. Amanda, what do we have coming up on State of the World? Um, so coming up, we're going to tackle everything from global movements for civil rights uh, to crises uh, coming up to watch in 2021 in the Horn of Africa. Uh, we also have a new YP series. So for every young professional out there, or if you know someone, uh, we invite them to join us. Uh, it'll include a special networking portion. Uh, the first two events are going to be discussing uh, defense against the dark arts in space and sports diplomacy. So we hope you can join us. You can check out the full schedule, as Megan said, online at ctwac.org. Uh, please subscribe. You'll be able to revisit this conversation. Uh, I know I'm going to on our State of the World podcast, wherever you get your podcasts, uh, and on the YouTube channel at World Affairs Council of Connecticut. Uh, so please check that out. We'll be posting this conversation, and uh, we hope to see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Yaya.